humans make sense of the world in a very sophisticated way. We make use of our five senses of seeing, hearing, touching, smelling and tasting. And we combine all of that information in such a way that we can understand the world. Now computers don't have access to these perceptual modalities. Computers do things differently. The stuff that they do still amazes us. If you think of what Google does and how effortlessly it retrieves the things that you're looking for, or how Facebook organizes your newsfeed, or how you can order practically any anything on Amazon, it's amazing. And we're so used to interacting with computers, and they're so useful to us, that we tend to kind of take them for granted. And what happens then is that we overestimate their capabilities. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So if we have these two sentences, John and Mary's pets like playing in the yard. They constructed a fence to keep them safe. If I give these two sentences to a human and then I say, who does they refer to and who does them refer to? We can do this without any trouble. So we understand that John and Mary are people and that they have pets and that they like their pets and want to keep them safe and protect them. So if you have your pets playing around in your yard, they might run out onto the street and maybe get hit by a car. And this is something that they don't want to happen. So for that reason, they construct a fence to keep their pets safe. So they is John and Mary and them is their pets. If I give this to a machine, it's much harder. And the reason for that is that if I grammatically analyze this sentence, there's actually no way of knowing what they or what them refers to. The way us humans do this is by looking at the meaning of these words. So looking at the meaning of fence, for example. Another way of saying this is that what humans are very good at is having common sense reasoning. And this is something that machines really struggle with. So the core to getting to common sense is having meaning in computers. And the famous uh, linguist Ray Jackendorf has said that meaning is a holy grail of a variety of disciplines. Not only linguistics, but also philosophy, psychology, and the neurosciences. And I would like to argue here that artificial intelligence, the research discipline, is very much a part of that list of disciplines where meaning is the holy grail, so the end goal. And the reason for that is that we absolutely need meaning if we want to have common sense reasoning. So my research has been concerned with trying to improve the way that computers understand meaning by making them learn to understand meaning in a more human way. One of the problems that we absolutely need to solve if we want to have meaning is the so-called symbol grounding problem. And this is a problem that has a very long history in philosophy, arguably going back all the way to Plato and Aristotle. But its most famous recent incarnation uh, with an uh, application to AI is a thought experiment by the philosopher John Searle. And Searle says, suppose you have what he calls the Chinese room. And there's a person inside this room with a big book of rules that tell him what to do when Chinese characters get input into the room. So we can have someone standing outside of the room, scribbling Chinese characters on pieces of paper, putting them in, and if the person inside the room does a good job following the rules, he might output sequences of Chinese characters that are completely fluent. So it might look like he's actually fluent in Chinese. And then Searle asks you, do you think that this person is fluent in Chinese? And phrased this way, of course, we're inclined to say, no, he doesn't. He's just following the rules in a book. That's exactly the problem here. What computers do is something that's very similar to this. So you might phrase this as saying, can you le learn Chinese from a Chinese dictionary that's written completely in Chinese? Because that is what computers do. So the way computers learn meaning these days is through something called the distributional hypothesis. And the distributional hypothesis says, you shall know a word by the company that it keeps. So let me give you an example of what that means. We take a large corpus of text, let's say Wikipedia, and if we want to know the meaning of cat and dog, we look at all the occurrences of these words in Wikipedia. And then we look at the company that they keep. So we can see that cat co-occurs very often with fur and with purred, and dog co-occurs with barked. So this allows us to see something about what these things mean. And if we add up all of these different counts, then we can construct something that's called a vector space model. And a vector space model allows us to see how similar two things are to each other. So every word is, is a vector, and we can calculate how similar these two things are. So that allows us to see that dog and cat are closer to each other in meaning than they are to moon, 
because they occur in more similar contexts. Now, a nice thing about these vector spaces is that we can visualize them in a two-dimensional plot. So every one of these points here is a word, and its location is determined by its meaning. So, for example, here we would have captain, politician, and soldier, because they're all humans. And down there we have animals, snakes and birds and hawks. So, looking at this space, we can investigate how close two things are in meaning when we look at something from a particular angle. And the way we learn where to put these points these days is by using neural networks. You might have heard of neural networks or deep learning. It's uh, very much the hype these days as a machine learning technique for learning representations. And the way we do that is by trying to predict the context, which means that we suffer from the grounding problem because we're defining these meanings in terms of other words. Now you might say the grounding problem is not really a problem at all. If I want to understand the meaning of democracy, I can go to Wikipedia and I can uh, read that it's a political system, etc., etc. And in this case, for abstract words like democracy, you're probably right. So the textual modality or the type of information text is enough for learning the meaning of democracy. And indeed, if I switch to a different modality, pictures, for example, this is not really telling me much about what democracy actually means. Sure, it's an association, so if you type democracy uh, in Google Images and you look at the pictures that you get, you get American flags and things like that, but that's not really what democracy means. So, so far so good. We don't really suffer from the grounding problem. However, if I want to understand the meaning of cat, and I again go to Wikipedia, I can learn that it's a small carnivorous furry mammal that people like to use as pets. And sure, that's part of what cat is to us, but to us humans, a cat is much more than that, because a cat is much closer to this. <laughs> and the reason for that is because of the way we interact with the world. So we understand the meaning of cat through the perceptual experiences that we have. So there's a thing that we look at and that we can hear and that we can touch, and that together makes the meaning of cat. So my research is about trying to make computers do this, so trying to make computers use perception in a similar way to how humans do that. So how would we go about doing that? We can take inspiration from the human brain. So if I show the cat picture to the brain, what happens is that the photons fall on your retina and you process this in your brain uh, trying to make sense of it. And as you go deeper inside your brain, you become more and more abstract. So you get a concept representation of cat at some point deep in your brain. And you can reason with that concept representation and, for example, think about what would happen if your cat is not fenced in in the yard and gets hit by a car. So we can do a similar thing again using neural networks which are inspired by the brain, and we show uh, pictures of cats to neural networks. And we show lots of these pictures, and we let the neural network learn what the meaning is of cat, and then we look at the far end at the things that it's learned. And this allows us to see uh, the visual meaning of a concept. So instead of the textual meaning that we had earlier, we can now have a visual meaning. So what I'd like to show you is some examples of what happens when we make this transition from textual information to visual information so that you can really see the difference. So here we have some uh, concepts highlighted again in this space. So remember, every point is a word and its location is determined by its meaning. Give and take are so close linguistically that they actually overlap. So you only see take here. That's how close they are. But of course, we know that generous should be much closer to give than it should be to take. We also know visually that love and Valentine should probably be closer to each other. And the same goes for wide and panorama. What I'd like to show you is what happens when we move to visual space and then you can see the transition happening live. So wide and panorama move together, love and Valentine move together and give moves towards generous and away from take. So what happens there is that you have a different perspective on the meaning of these concepts. And in this case, that perspective is probably closer to what you really want than what you got from the textual modality. But we can also do this the other way around. Remember I said that for democracy, you probably want to learn it from Wikipedia, and you don't want to learn it from Google Images. So you want text rather than vision. So if we start from vision, we can see for these abstract concepts, chaos, anarchy, destruction, 
They're kind of evenly distributed in this space. And this is not what we want. We want these three things at the bottom to be close and far away from order because they're the opposites. But because these concepts are abstract, it's very hard to learn that from pictures. But if we make the transition, we can see that these concepts move together as we turn towards the textual perspective. So this shows that for different concepts, there are different ways of looking at things. And uh, sometimes one way is better and sometimes the other. And so far, I've talked about vision and text, but it's not restricted to that. We can do the same thing, but then with audio. So now we're thinking about what things sound like. So if I have a rocket and an explosion, a demolition and fireworks, these should all be very close because they sound like explosions. And the same goes for sounds produced by water, so splash and river and waterfall. And the same goes again for sounds produced by humans, so protest or sing or the sound of children. So we can make that transition from text to the audio space and we can see the water sounds moving to the top left, the explosion sounds coming together and the people sounds coming together. So if we're thinking about the auditory modality and taking an auditory perspective on the meaning of these words, then uh, this is a much better way of thinking about the meaning of those concepts. Now, I'm not trying to say that there's a best way to look at the meaning of these concepts, what I'm trying to say is, that as with so many things, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So what you want, ideally, is to take information from all of these different perceptual modalities and combine it into one multimodal meaning representation that covers all of these different aspects of these concepts. So we can have waves and water and ocean and surf and think about them in all of these different modalities. And then as we make the transition towards multimodal space, these things come together and we more accurately model their meaning in the sense of what they mean for humans. Experiments have been done with this and, and it's shown that if you go multimodal, then you become much closer to how humans actually think about meaning. So ultimately, this is something worthwhile pursuing. And my general point is that if we want computers to get common sense reasoning and if we want machines to develop human level artificial intelligence, then we need to think about the world in a similar way to how humans perceive the world. That is, we need to make use of these perceptual modalities in order to learn the meaning of the things that happen in the world around us. So I've talked about uh, vision and, and audio, but you can also think of making machines smell things or taste things or touch things. And ultimately, this will get us much closer to human level artificial intelligence. So let's return to the example that we started with. The core here is in understanding the meaning. And the, one of the key words here that we need to understand is the word fence. Because a fence is something that you use to keep things in, in such a way that they don't run out onto the road and get hit by a car. So how would we go about understanding the word fence? Well, one way to do this is we can construct a physical robot and have him try to climb the fence that we built. Maybe you can try to move around it every once in a while it might succeed in climbing over this fence and experience what it's like to be hit by a car and maybe discover that that's not something that you want to have happen to you. But this would be very expensive, not only because we keep destroying our robot, but because it would take a very, very long time for us to learn the things that humans take for granted. If we have to do all of these different things individually, it would take ages. But the alternative is to do this not with a physical fence, but with a virtual fence. So now we have a virtual robot in a virtual world trying to climb a virtual fence and maybe every once in a while getting hit by a virtual car. But that's not much of a problem because we can do this an infinite amount of times. And that means that we can learn things much more efficiently, especially with neural networks that require a lot of data. And for that reason, uh, there's a lot of interest in the AI community now to be able to solve these complex problems that you see in video games. Because if AI is ever going to emerge, it's much more likely to do so in this virt virtual world than it is in our physical world. And who knows, maybe one day we'll have machines that have common sense. Thank you.